Live from Dublin, Ireland, it's The Cube. Covering Hadoop Summit Europe 2016. Brought to you by Hortonworks. Now your host, Dave Vellante. Welcome back to Hadoop Summit Dublin, everybody. This is The Cube, The Cube goes out to the events, we extract the signal to the noise. Uh, this evening, the big event is, of course, at the Guinness factory, we're excited about that. The customers are all going to be there, drinking that lovely beer. Andrea Capodacasa is here, uh, joined by uh, Hessel Miedema. Uh, these gentlemen are big data architects with Capgemini, based out of London. Gentlemen, welcome to theCUBE. Thank you very much. We got the, the double factor of the big data architects, big brains, uh, in touch with customers and what customers are doing. So, so let's unpack it. I mean, we've been talking all day how Hadoop and big data, it's kind of reaching adolescence, right? And uh, growing up. Uh, so Andrea, let me start with you. So from, from Capgemini's perspective, where, where are we in this whole big data theme? So, uh, <clears throat> after a few years in which, uh, uh, let's say, the big data was this uh, uh, technical novelty and was a technical problem, now we start to see with our customers, especially the largest ones, uh, uh, the first uh, large implementations uh, that, that are going into production. And so, uh, we see the focus that is shifting from the um, technical problem into a more uh, into a wider problem. So you need also to take into consideration the, the operational and the organizational aspects when you want to tra uh, transition smoothly into these modern architectures. So Hessel, you guys are both big data architects. Um, what is that in the world of, of Capgemini? You look like you dress like a big data architect. Andrea, you dress like a business person. So, but you guys are both big data architects. Is that a technical role? Is it a business role? Is it a dual role? Talk about um, that. So I guess probably this on the, on the dividing line of business and technology <laughs> and so many of these kind of roles. Um, I think the last couple of years it was primarily a technical role because we we're just trying to implement all these new technologies and, and, and learning how to implement them in the best way because nobody had done it before. I think uh, nowadays it is more about trying to establish well, a business transformation to actually know how to leverage all this information and that's now readily available for all the people in the business. And, and how much of the role is st strategy versus sort of implementation? It depends on the project, of course. And also the, the let's say, the, the suta is, uh, is depending on the project <laughs> uh, in general. Uh, but I would say at the moment, uh, I think we are lucky enough uh, to uh, be uh, considered as advisors for uh, our customers uh, in their transition to the new world. So I would say that, uh, uh, especially lately, we are probably 60 to 80% uh, in the advisory and in the strategy and in uh, creating this roadmap to, for a smooth transition rather than the, the implementation. I mean, essentially your company is, is all about getting people to do something to improve their business or their organization. Yeah. I mean, doing nothing's a strategy, it's just not a, a very good one. So you're trying to achieve business outcomes. So one of the things you guys are talking about is moving folks to a modern data architecture, uh, generally big data, I guess, specifically. Uh, what does that mean? Um, I guess it means that you understand your landscape well enough that you can leverage all the technologies that are available in the big data ecosystem to the best of their advantage. And if you look at all the vendors here at the Hadoop Summit, there's so many technologies to choose from, and, uh, but actually leverage them in the, in the best way, and, and, and I guess a lot of lessons that were already there, for example, in the data warehousing world, uh, that everybody has experience with for tens and t tens of years, uh, we have to a little bit relearn uh, re again. So for example, how do you manage your data and how do you uh, tackle data quality and all those kind of things? So the, the traditional enterprise data warehouse, Andrea, has um, we got a kind of a love-hate with it, I'll say that, right? I mean, it's obviously driven a lot of business value, but it's been a challenge for people. Um, it's like a snake swallowing a basketball in terms of data. Uh, it's very difficult to keep up. Uh, you have to go through a select few analysts that can get you the answer. And the architecture is, you put a big pipe into a big box, you know, yeah. and, and then you have some lords over that, that box. So, so how is a modern 
data architecture different than what I just described? And is it fair what I just described? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a really good uh, good question. And uh, you know, the, the promise of the uh, enterprise data warehouse was to have this kind of unified architecture, this kind of uh, uh, you know ivory tower. And it's on top there was the oracle, the, the definition, uh, full definition of the reality. And this uh, did not work. So this single view, uh, it's uh, something that cannot be achieved by a single architecture. So what uh, these new architectures are bringing is the agility. So you will have uh, different layers. Uh, this is something that actually we will be speaking about uh, later in our presentation at three o'clock. Let me do some sort Please, of self-promotion. <laughs> three o'clock, uh, uh -huh. the second floor. Uh, so coming back, there will be still uh, uh, some sort of data that are very well certified, uh, very well, um, you know, the, of a higher quality. Uh, and these uh, are, let's say, in what uh, we call the traditional data warehouse. But then we have uh, more uh, um, flexible ways uh, to, to join new data that are giving us uh, a, a better business insight. So we are building on what was uh, the uh, data warehouse that is not the only way to, to, to show uh, the data that are bringing business, but we essentially have this kind of archipelago of data that are uh, interconnected. And so this is possible just to these new architectures that are very open, very flexible, and, uh, and very powerful. And not and to mention it's very cheap. Is this always cloud? Is it 100% cloud, however you define cloud? Or? From, from our point of view, we are agnostic. I mean, the data uh, needs to stay in the in the place where they need to reside. Especially in Europe, you know that there are uh, uh, some concerns uh, about uh, the privacy. Uh, there are different nations that have different views on this. Uh, so sometimes the best option is to to keep them uh, uh, in, uh, let's say, um, data centers, etc. So cloud uh, uh, is an option. In many cases, is a fantastic option, especially to, to start very, very quick, uh, because you can start immediately focusing on the data rather than on the infrastructure. But we are open to many different... Uh, but what if I define cloud differently than where the data goes? What if I define cloud as sort of the operational experience? In other words, you know, people think of public cloud, Amazon, Azure, whatever, is very simple and yeah. agile. If, what, can I replicate that on-premise? Today. Absolutely. Okay, so let's call that cloud. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So is it fair to say that everything must be cloud yeah. as I've just defined it? Yeah, I, I think in, in your exception, essentially, what, what I, if I can rephrase it, uh, yeah, sure. uh, the, the users need to focus on their analysis, not on the iron that is uh, allowing their analysis. And so this is, we're going in that cloud in the sense that we are uh, leaving behind, we are hiding uh, the technical complexity and we are uh, uh, leaving the users uh, uh, to what uh, they need to do, that is business. So, so I wonder if you could comment on the, on the following. So we've seen these, this emergence of, of Hadoop and, and data lakes, et cetera. And I want to talk about the business value that customers are seeing. It seems that a lot of the business value is coming from cutting costs. Mm -hmm. Hadoop is a cheaper storage container than putting it in a you know, million dollar mainframe box, for example. Um, so okay, that's a good way to get ROI, cut the cost. Have we gone beyond that? And what kind of examples can you give in terms of real, tangible business value? Um, I guess the easiest uh, examples are, for, uh, are in domain, for example, like fraud analytics. Mm -hmm. And uh, just seeing who's doing any credit card, uh, credit card fraud. Um, and with the proper data scientist, it is actually quite easy with all the technology that's available now um, to find those kind of patterns. And, um, and that's like, uh, for example, predictive asset management. That's something uh, I think that's getting very, very, uh, very popular right now. So that you can actually, for example, maintain very expensive equipment before actually it breaks down. So is that, I want to I follow up on that, is that a technology factor or is it a, is it a cost factor in the sense that I don't, I, it's now inexpensive for me to eliminate sampling, for instance, fraud detection. Yep. I couldn't do it before because it was just too expensive, or is it a case where the technology wouldn't allow it, it was too rigid, too stovepiped, is it or some kind of combination? Um, I think it's actually giving the tools to the right data scientists to actually leverage that information. And um, just, the, just the enablement that a Hadoop environment can bring um, to indeed not use any sampling, but also just 
create many, many models of machine learning that you want to test against your data. Uh, that really is the big differentiator, and, and the agility that it, that it offers. Has the data scientist kind of taken over the role of the business you know, analyst, the person who built the cubes and, and so forth? Uh, are, are, they, are they a bottleneck? Uh, they can be, because in some cases, when you have to do something that is very complicated, uh, you need uh, uh, to have very specialized and very bright people uh, that are kind of unicorns in the term. That they need to understand the mathematical models, they need to understand the business, and they need to understand the underlying technology to crunch this massive quantity of data. However, the solution uh, is to keep the data scientist where it's strictly needed because there are many cases in which, for example, the fraud analytics, you need a data scientist to set up the system. But then the analyst, without the you know, mathematical degree, can easily use the parameters, can tweak it to, to identify if there are frauds. So, uh, in essence, again, you will have very specialized people for very complex tasks, but in general, you are giving very sophisticated tools that are easy to, to generate and agile to change for, for a much wider and less specialized audience. So let's simplify the discussion for us. Let's say there's two types of installations, architectures. One's the traditional enterprise data warehouse and the other is sort of the modern architecture what you guys yeah. are espousing. When you go into talk to clients, do you see patterns emerging? for each of these that are clearly discernible? Is it still fuzzy? I wonder if we could talk about that, Hessel. Um, well, I think it is, it is very sensible just to think about your use case. What do you want to use? Okay. And uh, so data warehousing technology is, is clearly not obsolete. Uh, but what you do see is that more and more use cases can be delivered uh, by big data platforms. So um, I think, and I think most of the people who are building data warehouses already are doing this for a long, long time. So they know when to build a data warehouse. I think it is very important to actually know what, is the, what are the right use cases to start leveraging a modern data architecture. And of course, if it's streaming data, probably it's quite likely that you want to use a modern data architecture. If it's unstructured data, of course you want to use a Hadoop architecture. If it's structured data, well, I guess it's a cost-benefit um, kind of analysis that you have to do. Okay, so let's assume the use case lends itself to a modern data architecture. What do you see as the, the critical success factors to getting there? So, in general, of course, you need to find the right set of tools uh, for, uh, for the uh, right case. It's kind of obvious, but sometimes, uh, I say, the enthusiasm for uh, some particular technical solution is prevailing. This, of course, now is, a, is a kind of fading uh, this kind of problem. But then, of course, we need also to, to make sure that uh, we are able to transition to the new architecture in a, in a very uh, simple and smooth way. The users, uh, they wanted to have their continuity when they are uh, after the migration. So we, we, we have uh, also this kind of decommissioning strategy. And of course, we need also to take into consideration the user adoption. Most of the users uh, don't even know what is big data. This is the reality. Okay? We are super excited, but in reality, uh, users, especially in big companies, uh, they barely know what is a database, so they cannot really understand. So. Uh, we, we, we really need to, to think about a communication plan. We need to get them excited about the, the possibilities that are enormous, about the, what you can do, uh, like joining the old data, let's say, with this uh, streaming data, the, the fraud data, all the data that are so different, uh, so, so big, so fast, etc. So this is uh, something that needs to be done, it cannot be left uh, uh, you know, the impro improvisation. But so the reward is huge because then the users we love, we start to love immediately the new, and we forget the old. And then you can decommission much quicker than, than the older. So let's talk a little bit more about that adoption. How, how, you know, you go through the process of, you know, you're consulting with your customers, advising them. Maybe they have you do some of the implementation work. They bring their pe best people in, and now they've got this modern data architecture. So you talked about some of the ways in which you can get adoption but can you operationalize it so adoption can really go through the roof? So I think uh, maybe our biggest success story in this is I think uh, when we are able to actually create physical environments uh, where the data scientists and the, the business analysts and the consumers, the end consumers of the data get together. So when you create these insight centers, um, 
it really provides a collaborative environment where you can actually transform the raw data to well, the, actually the business insights uh, that you're looking for. And I think, again, if you then compare it with a traditional uh, setup, it's actually where you used to have the, the business analyst and the data modeler sitting there from their ivory tower creating these models of which they think will lead to business insights. Now you can have a direct impact on how you're going to use the data and uh, find those insights. So actually, when you can set up a physical environment where people can be close together, we definitely recommend it. It's, it's always a success. So that physical, the proximate collaboration, interesting. Yeah. Um, we joke a lot in theCUBE about the data lakes. My partner, John Furrier, he doesn't like data lakes. He likes data ocean because lakes sometimes become ponds and they turn into swamps. And how do you avoid that, that dynamic, the, the data lake just being a bog of data of no value? So even that, uh, you know, we are in a world in which uh, uh, we have the traditional data that even before the big data, they were significant. But now they, they, they start to explode. You see, like uh, the, the terabytes of data that are uh, created by any sensors, any plane, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so you need uh, uh, some processes uh, that make sense of the data that you are introducing into the data lake. And then you need, uh, on the other end, uh, to give the users uh, a, a very simple user experience to get uh, the data that they want in a really simple way, not in a technical way, that are able to join the data so they, they get uh, uh, most of the information that they want. So these are the, the new challenges. And we do it this in, in two ways. When we ingest the data, we are working on uh, um, the automatic uh, metadata creation. So we are tagging the data. Uh, this is a customer uh, uh, data. We are ingesting them only if they are not duplicating, only if they are not replicating data that are already existing. We suggest where they can join other mm -hmm. transactions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Maybe we can uh, make sure you know, when ingest a PDF with a, I don't know, a letter, I understand that this letter is from this person, and I join it to the rest of this. And this is done automatically. On the other hand, there is an interface, let's say Google-like, in which there is a user say, I want to see. Uh, the most, uh, the, the highest, uh, the most likely causes of fraud, fraud, and then there are essentially a, a set of information that are categorized uh, uh, and are leveraging this information that I um, created when I was ingesting the data. So this is uh, crucial because uh, since the data uh, that we are ingesting are uh, enormous and very fast you need an automated process to to tag the data you cannot rely on uh, just manual processes and so when you talk to customers what's the biggest concern is it hey i have to modernize because there's an, such an opportunity there's such a huge roi or is it i have to do this because the organization is pressuring us to do this and i need to make sure it's secure and compliant and the data location is proper and it's governed, et cetera. Which of those seems to be the overriding factor? So I guess from a business perspective, they just want to use the data and they, use, they heard all these great use cases and stories. Uh, so they always just keep pushing everybody. We really want to apply machine learning to our data or we really want to be able to correlate these data sets. Then of course, when you talk to the IT departments of the big enterprises, it's always a discussion and how can we do this secure? Secure. How can we meet up with compliance and regulations uh, and all those? So it's really dependent on to who you talk uh, within an organization. And I guess that's also why we as a system integrator try to talk to all these parties to align everybody within an organization. Uh, what's the engagement model? How do customers engage? Are you typically going talking to the line of business? Are you Talking to IT, are you bringing the two together? What's the engagement model? Uh, it, de it depends on the engagement itself. It depends on the use case that uh, we, we, we know. It depends. Uh, some, sometimes there are uh, requests for uh, information, requests for proposal, and uh, in which we have a landscape uh, that probably they want to migrate or uh, some use cases that they want to address. Uh, most uh, generally, we are asked for a point of view on uh, what they can do with these new technologies. So we, we are given information about their current landscape. We use our uh, experience in all uh, our customer base uh, and uh, we are giving them some use cases with other companies that are a little bit uh, more advanced in this, uh, in this case uh, and we help them. But mm, you know, we, we respond to all uh, types of uh, uh, engagements. 
can be very specific. I want to do this with this technology, so, right? No problem. We have experience uh, essentially in all the technologies, uh, rather than starting for, uh, from uh, like a roadmap. Uh, uh, that, that is not well defined you know, at, the, at the start, essentially. Just, just to, to start them and to, to organize themselves for uh, transitioning smoothly. And you guys are part of a big data practice, not specific to any industry, is that right? But you have industry focus in some cases, is, is that true? Or? Uh, yeah, so uh, we've got a global big data practice. So uh, I mean, you're part of that. Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's a global organization within Capgemini that's just, it's called Insights and Data, and it's just purely focused on uh, big data and analytics and uh, things around that. But the big data team definitely has a big data uh, of a global focus, because it's just a, it's a global problem. And all our clients are global as well. Right. Um, so you have to have that, that global mindset. And also we have uh, the global size, because we have 10,000 people and growing uh, with significant rates yeah. every year. And so we are very lucky because we work with the most advanced uh, customers. Uh, uh, that not only are addressing these problems, they have already solved uh, them thanks to, to our help. And so we are very happy to help uh, also the new companies that are uh, embracing this transition uh, to, uh, to, to get there uh, smoothly and successfully. Excellent, all right, we'll leave it there. Gentlemen, thanks very much for coming inside theCUBE. Thank you for inviting yeah, us. Thank you for having you. us. Thank you. All right, keep it right there, everybody. Check out, go on Twitter and check out hashtag Cube Gems, you'll see little snippets of the interviews uh, from today. Check out siliconangle.tv. Of course, go to wikibon.com. We just released our latest big data market forecast. And as always, go to siliconangle.com for all the news. This is theCUBE, right back, right after this word from Dublin. <laughs>